<sighs> Hi y'all, Kraken Latte here. So, as I've noticed while doing my solo raw gold videos, I seem to have a lot of viewers who are new to WoW as I've gotten a lot of questions about why I like raw gold and what raw gold even is. So let's go over the topic of raw gold and I'll do my best to help you understand what it's all about. So let's make this as simple as possible. What is raw gold? Raw gold is gold that does not require another player for profit. So anything sold on the auction house is not raw gold. Anything requiring a transaction with another player, including opening trade with goods and services, is not raw gold. Raw gold is gold received directly from vendoring items of any quality and dropped directly from any mob or boss. It really is as simple as that. So why do I like raw gold? To put it plainly, it's active. It gets me out in the world. I can explore and just run around. Gathering herbs, ore, and skins can give a similar feel, but I'd long since got burned out on mindlessly following node routes. You could argue the same for raids, but it's simply a matter of preference. With running old raids and dungeons, I can go experience any aesthetic of my current mood, learn some mog and pets, and mounts, and make some gold while doing it. On a more serious note, why do I think it's good? Isn't farming herbs faster? Well, yes and no. I get told a lot that farming herbs is better, as you can make so much more gold in an hour. But the problem with that argument is that the herbs themselves are not gold. They require someone else, another player, to buy them. So you may not actually make what they're worth in an hour. You could even be ruthlessly undercut and have the prices you'd farmed for slip away. Plus, every server's economy is different. Prices will vary and change. So what's good for you may not be good for me. But do not mistake me. I am in no way arguing against the auction house. All of this is perfectly fine. I use the auction house to sell things too. It's a vital process in a living, breathing economy. But raw gold is unaffected by all of this, you see. Raw gold don't care about market value. You aren't waiting for someone to buy your items. Raw gold, in a sense, is instant. So because of that, it makes sense that it's a little slower to obtain as gold is being generated rather than being passed between players. So why do I think this is good? Well, this introduces fresh gold into the market. It takes money to make money, as they say, and someone who has no gold can't buy anything. And then, where do you think that new gold will go? It has to be spent somewhere, and chances are, it'll be on the auction house. Wait, but what if you're spending it on a vendor? It's not going back into the market. Well, you're right, it's not. So let me explain. Expensive mounts like the 5 million gold Brutosaur, for example, are called a gold sink. These are placed in the game to get gold out of the economy, specifically so that players have to generate new gold and thus breathe life back into the market. I have a suspicion that this is to prevent richer players from just sitting on their gold and never spending it, and also encourages broke folk to make gold. No proof on this though, it's just a thought. But there's more reasons why I like raw gold. Raw gold does not require a knowledge of the market. It does not require a special skill set. It does not require other players to function. And most importantly, it remains at a constant with set results until it is specifically nerfed by Blizzard, which means it is not affected by economic fluctuations. It has a very low barrier to entry, so anyone who can physically enter an instance can do it. Whether big time farmers like it or not, this is why this type of gold has such an appeal to many players. The only thing holding back that gold from getting into your pocket is you. Like with anything, making gold, regardless of how you do it, takes some time. It's just a matter of how you want to spend it. Raw gold is only on you though. And in times of weak economies that some may call a drought, raw gold is still there for you. This type of gold making is great for those who don't want to take the time to learn the market, those who just want some quick and easy cash, and those who want a fresh alternative to gold making. Even if it isn't your main source, it's also a great supplement. While you've got all your goods up for sale on the auction house, you can go run some old raids for a boost in gold. Nothing wrong with that. 
On a random note, it's kind of funny how much toxicity I've received over showing results of raw gold farms. But you know what? I don't care. I enjoy what I do and many, many of my viewers do too. I'm just happy to share what I do with anyone who's willing to listen. As a closing note, if raw gold is just not your thing, that's okay. No one's forcing you to do it and I've never claimed that it's the fastest or the bestest method. If it helps, I definitely recommend checking out some other channels like Want to Buy Gold, Bregvids, Modest Millions, Samaden Plays WoW, and tons of others for more ways to make gold. So I hope you found this video helpful and you now have a better understanding on what raw gold is and why I like it. Hi y'all, Kraken Latte here. I'll be covering three main points about the time to profit part of gold farming all from the perspective of a non-hardcore gold maker. These are the three points I use to determine if something is worth my time. All of these will be subjective and based on my opinions and experiences, so it's totally fine if you disagree. All examples I'll be using will be from BFA's patch 8.3 data, but my opinions will remain the same. Number one, is it easy? Easy, in this case, is rather subjective. When I consider what is and isn't easy, I'm looking at how much work I might have to put into a character before I can start the farm. Gear would be the simplest example. Is what I'm trying to farm going to slow me down because I don't have the current raid tiers gear? Can I just use the low bar world quest or BOE gear to accomplish it? Since I like to do things that I can farm with multiple alts, this is a major part of how I choose what I want to throw myself at. I can't be asked to go get heroic raid gear on a plethora of alts. I got better things to do. This is why I'm often fond of farms I can do in older content, since your gear doesn't usually matter there. An example here of easy and not easy would be doing a Skyreach run versus a Freehold run. To someone who only ever plays a small handful of characters, and they often do competitive content for gear, farming current content instances, like Freehold in this example, would be easy for them. However, for someone who doesn't care about gear, this is instantly a problem. As these can't be soloed without putting in a fair amount of time to get gear, and to get the current expansion powers, and perhaps to get max professions and max reputation, you get the idea. Hence why older content, which does not require that, tends to be more appealing to me as I don't have to put any effort into that character, and other characters, to accomplish it. Number two, is it fast? Again, this can be highly subjective and rather comes down to how much patience you have or time you're able to spend while still turning a worthy profit. Those all go hand in hand for me. While you might instantly think that this is just how fast you can clear something, this also includes things that I look at like, do I log in once a day and spend a few minutes or do I spend a handful of hours one day a week? How you allot your time here also plays heavily into it because the feeling of speed can be just as important as the actual time spent. This point is a mere gut sensation for me based on if I feel the results and effort are worth my time spent. Here's my example. Blackrock Foundry, Hellfire Citadel, and Terrace of Endless Spring are all raids you can do for raw gold with varying results. For Blackrock, I can average 7200 gold in about 45 minutes. Hellfire is about 9,000 in 90 minutes, and Terrace is about 800 in 5. Of these, Terrace has the highest gold per minute, but look at that puny result. Ugh. On the other hand, Hellfire has the highest total result, yet takes an hour and a half to do. For one character. Yuck. Blackrock, though, I can do in under an hour because you can do tricks in that raid for optimization, unlike Hellfire. And I can get almost as much gold in nearly half the time I'd spend in HFC. To me, that feels good, so that's why I consider this one fast. And point three, can I do this solo? Now here's the real point that defines me as a player. Can I do this without anyone else? I don't like being held back by other people when I'm trying to do stuff, and even worse, I don't like holding other people back. So farms that I can do without needing or bothering anyone else are awesome. These are also the farms that I don't feel pressured to do. 
I can put them down and walk away to grab lunch at any time without a timer haunting me or wasting someone else's time. I'm not a very patient person, so I can't expect others to be patient on me. So then, do I even use the auction house? That needs other people. Of course I do. It's a vital platform to any server's economy, but that can't be my only source of income. What happens when you just can't get stuff sold, like during content droughts, yet you're trying to save up for something expensive? Time to whip out the solo gold farms. You all know by now that I'm probably referring mainly to older instances, but this does include any current content stuff too. Let's pull in a wild card here. 2,000 gold emissaries in BFA. They don't come up often, but since I have an army of alts, I like this one. I can do these in 6-9 to nine minutes per character, and I can get upwards of 3,000 gold depending on the loot from the world quests. And if I so choose, I can do this with my best friend, which just makes it faster. The best solo farms often require you to be solo due to loot distribution. But since this is world content, that don't matter. A few hours of goofing off with my bestie in super easy content to get a few hundred thousand gold? Now that feels nice. So there we have it. It's pretty straightforward, I think. Those are my three points I use when considering a gold farm. You'll notice I didn't have efficiency or total worth on this list. Those, to me, are the culminating result of my three points. If I feel a farm is easy, fast, and it's soloable, then I begin to look at ways to make it efficient, and the experience of a few attempts will tell me if I think it's worth it. Do you have differing opinions? Any experiences on any of these points? Feel free to share. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Hi y'all, Kraken Latte here. With all this talk of gold making and brutosaurs, I thought it was time to go over different ways you can make gold and wow. This isn't a step-by-step how-to of every type, but rather a list and brief explanation of what's out there. Maybe you'll learn about something, maybe you'll get some ideas. Maybe you'll know of another one I didn't talk about. Either way, let's take a look at what we got. So, these aren't in a super specific order other than how I thought they looked good together on the list. Ones that are similar will be next to each other, and as we move along, I'll make a running list on the right to help you out visually. And to clarify a couple terms, when I say selling, I mean using the auction house or selling directly to another player. When I use the term vendoring, you are selling to a vendor NPC, not a player. I'll also show on screen what professions are usually involved with each type, but keep in mind that not every way to make gold needs a profession. I'll label those as such when we get to them. Number 1. Gathering and Selling Raw Materials This is a very basic entry-level category, but one vitally important to any server's economy. It is these noble gatherers, both casual and hardcore, who supply the herbs, the ore, the skins, and other raw materials to everyone on their entire server. Of both factions, even. From folks just leveling professions, to flippers, shufflers, and crafters, everyone needs materials at some point, sometimes even to just turn in a quest. There are various ways to gather these raw materials, which can include, but is certainly not limited to, gathering herbs and ore from nodes, fishing from water and pools, skinning leather and other animal parts from beasts, looting cloth or elemental items from mobs, and you get the idea. If you've ever picked a flower and sold it on the auction house, you've participated in this category and probably made someone very happy about that flower. Number 2. Crafting and Selling this is a very broad category as it includes all professions that can craft. It includes things like gear, glyphs, flasks, food, you name it. There are a few ways to go about this one too. You can do a sort of targeted approach and pick one type of item, say flasks, and only craft those to sell. Or you could craft multiple kinds, even from multiple professions, to cover a broader market. In addition to that, you require materials to craft. So you will either buy them or gather them yourself, thus bringing the previous category into the picture. The crafters are the people you can thank for your raid buffs, your alt gear, your glyphs, your bags, or anything else that falls into this category. If it was made by someone else's profession and you bought it, you've seen this market in action. Number 3. Farming and Selling Collectibles This mainly includes transmog gear, profession recipes, battle pets, and mounts. I've included all four of these items in this section as they are typically obtained in very similar matters and often overlap when farming, though it isn't uncommon that you'll focus only on one of these since they can all be quite an investment. 
All of these types of items can come from dungeons, raids, open world mobs, vendors, crafting professions, and much more. That's why I've lumped these all together. If you've ever wanted to own that cute little frog pet, or wield that sweet sword, it's highly likely that you could buy them from the auction house. Of course, looking at the collectibles themselves, there are a lot of soulbound items which aren't sellable, but there is still a huge amount that are. Don't believe me? Hop over to your auction house and take a gander at the list of gear for sale. I'd wager a guess that you don't have at least some of those appearances. Collecting is a huge part of this game, and there is certainly gold to be had in these markets, if you have the patience. Number 4. Raw Gold Farming and Vendoring I've done a video covering exactly what this is in greater detail, so check that out if you haven't already seen it. I've linked it for you in the description below. Either way, let's briefly cover it here and get an idea of where it fits in. Raw gold is any gold that does not require another player to obtain. So anytime you loot a mob that you've killed, no matter where it is, and got some currency from it, that's raw gold. This includes gold obtained from both instances and the open world. Instanced farming, which is done in dungeons and raids, is best done solo due to how the loot system works. On the other hand, open world mob farming is best done in groups to help force spawns and kill faster. As you can imagine, these overlap with the raw materials and collectibles categories, so make sure you look at what items you've gathered before you vendor away. Some may argue that this is not a legitimate method of gold making, but that's a strange argument since this category is how newly generated gold is introduced back into the existing markets. And in fact, this method is more beholden to the old school non-MMO games where you'd go dungeon crawling repeatedly and vendor all the spoils to get your gold. Number 5. Shuffling and Converting This category includes both the raw gold and transaction-based methods. A shuffle is when you take materials and change them into something else for higher profit. That might not be the best explanation, as crafting fits that description too. But the reason for that is because this is a derivative of crafting, and thus often needs professions to complete. Let's look at some examples for you to understand. A raw gold shuffle would be farming a specific material, we'll use leather in this case, and turn them into crafted gear with a high vendor price and then vendoring it all. In this case, skinning and leatherworking are both needed to complete the process, but it is raw gold since no other players were involved. Now this changes from raw gold to transaction based if you decide you don't want to farm the materials and instead buy them on the auction house to then craft and vendor. There is another version of this, using only the auction house to make profit. I like to call it converting so it isn't confused with the other version we just talked about, but the proper term is shuffling. Using the auction house, you could buy a material that could be crafted into another version of itself, but it is still in the basic state. For example, cobalt ore being smelted into cobalt bars. In this case, the bars are worth more than the ore since they require an extra step to create. So you'd buy ore, smelt it, and post for a higher price than what you bought it for. You can do the same thing with items that don't require professions to convert as well, such as modes of harmony which take 10 of themselves to turn into a spirit of harmony. Of course, make sure you take into account how much both versions of the item cost and how many go into them, so you don't screw yourself over. Number 6. Flipping This is the old-fashioned art of buying low and selling high. This can include any item at all, as it is not profession related, and this is using only the auction house for both the goods and the profit. This one certainly requires a knowledge of how markets work, especially yours, as it can be a risky business, sort of like gambling. Here's how this works. Let's use current raid gear as an example. This piece, going for a hefty price on the auction house, is posted for lower than the market average, so you'd buy it and post it for either the market price or even higher. In theory, it's as simple as that, but it can be highly competitive, so you must pay attention to market prices, sell rate, and know when certain items will be in season. Such as, high item level crafted gear from professions will be much higher demand right before and at the start of a new raid release, but would certainly slow way down many months after. Number 7. Sniping This is essentially an advanced form of flipping, as it's basically the same thing, but far more intense. A sniper will frequently scan the auction house for items placed way below the market or server average by a certain percent, buy it, and then post it at a higher price. This is separated from flipping as it's often more aggressive and time consuming, and is sort of like the mean cousin to flipping. But whether you like snipers or not, 
they are still created in commerce by purchasing their lower priced items. The gold is still flowing. Number eight, vendor or convenience selling. A bit more niche, but these are folks who buy items and materials from vendors and sell them for higher prices on the auction house. Any items. It could be those limited quantity recipes from hidden vendors across the world, or it could be the cooking vendor's coffee and potatoes. All this comes down to convenience, and while some might think this is a bit scammy, I guarantee you there are plenty of folks who couldn't be asked to deal with vendors and would just buy everything from the auction house. Why is this important? Well, it's convenient. Number nine, event farming and selling. This commonly focuses on holiday and dark moon fair events, but can include other events too, like pre-patches or the WoW anniversary. This covers any event that has special items for sale only when that event is active. Often, it includes special currency that has to be farmed specifically from this event, which is why I separate it from the vendor selling category. You could even include time walking as one of these events. These folks buy a quantity of the unique items from the event vendor, wait until the event is over before selling them. Since these items are now only available through these sellers, it's often that they control the prices. And for our last category, number 10, boosting and carries. This category includes any transaction where you pay someone to help you or do something for you. They could be leveling you through dungeons by completing them for you, carrying you through raids for achievements and mounts, or carrying you through raided PvP. All of these are forms of carries, but are also sometimes called boosts, since you can be boosted in level or gear score. Either way, this category is about services rather than goods. It isn't uncommon to see carries for ahead of the curve mounts being advertised, or a plus 15 mythic key carry to get that weekly chest. Whatever the service, it's important to your server's economy as it gets the gold moving and supplies things to players who may not have the time or interest in the challenge, but are happy to pay for the reward. Hi all, Crack and Latte here. So, why don't we take a moment to go over a couple of points on how I save up gold without farming for it on purpose. This isn't some super secret tip about mass gold income, I'm just showing you what I do to make sure I save what I get. Now I want to preface this. My tips here will not apply to everyone, only those who may play like I do and it will become painfully obvious why when I cover each point. So with that in mind, let's look up how I save my gold without even thinking about it. So the first and most major point would be that I have a personal guild bank. This is easy to set up and only requires one alt to contain. If you don't have this, I highly recommend it, but obviously not everyone's going to want one. So if you already don't like this step, then the rest won't work for you. I recommend you keep watching though, you might change your mind. So personal guild. In that guild, I have all of my alts. I don't raid or do any sort of competitive content that requires I be in someone else's guild, so I can do this. Though I did this anyways back when I raided in Mop through Legion. If you do raid, you can still have your non-raiding alts in a personal guild while your raiders remain in that competitive guild. So this still works just fine. Next, I have the add-on GB Auto Deposit, made for me by the lovely Light Sky in my channel Discord, which will auto deposit any gold in your bags as soon as you open the guild bank, so long as you have it checked to do so. See why I said a personal guild was needed? I don't think you want to give all your gold to your raiding guild, though I'm sure they wouldn't mind. And don't worry, you can set the amount of gold you want to remain in your bags by typing slash gbad and then entering the number. This is also where you check if you want the add-on on or off. For me, I like 50 gold. It's enough to cover flight points and any repairs I may need out on the field are direct to the guild anyways. With that in place, now I just play the game. All types of content in WoW do generate some sort of gold no matter how small, as well as random items that get stuffed into your bag. So after a day of weeklies, dailies, world quests, leveling old raids, or even current raids, you'll have more gold than you left with. Granted, you don't go spend it all. Of course, how do you remember to actually open your guild bank so you can deposit all of your gold? Well, you don't, sort of. The advantage of having a personal guild is you can stuff all the random items you come across into those tabs for a bank alt to sell. 
and when you do that, your gold is auto-deposited each time. So if you can get into the habit of cleaning out your bags before each time you log out, your gold will quietly grow, as will your stash of random items. Naturally, it'd be wise to sell those items on the auction house rather than hoarding them away to rot, which is why I have a bank alt parked in the Vale of Eternal Blossoms. This alt has engineering so that they can use the auction house here, and enchanting so they can disenchant all the gear that I find isn't worth selling. And this alt is a rogue so I can open lockboxes since those can go into the guild bank too. I happen to like the Vale auction spot because it has the auction house, a guild bank, a personal bank, a vendor, and a mailbox all right there. Plus, you can set your hearth to return here directly. Any place with an auction house and a mailbox will work just fine, but this one's nice and compact, so it feels cozy. Once I have this alt set up, they just stay here. I get on every morning and post all of my auctions while sipping some coffee. I don't really care what I'm posting or for how much, I just post everything without really looking, and I can do that thanks to another great add-on, Trade Skill Master, since you can set it to just auto-price everything for you. I may sound a bit crazy, but that's literally how I save my gold when I'm not hounding after a gold sink. I just play the game normally auction every day and make sure to empty my bags before I log. It's a super simple cycle, but it's been working great for me, and I'm almost never broke because of it. Hi all, Kraken Latte here. So I've been asked many times about what classes are the best for gold making and which are my favorite. The best classes can vary depending on what you're using them for, so what I'm going to cover here are my favorites. This won't be a super in-depth deep dive guide on how to play them as classes tend to change as the expansions go by but I will give an overview to give you an idea of why I like them. So, these will be listed in my least to most favorite and I'll go over a bit about them, the spec I prefer, and why I like them. Remember, these are just my favorites. This isn't the end all list for min-max gold makers. This is just for fun. Starting with number five, Monk. Monk is actually one of my top favorite classes to play in WoW, but as you can imagine, it's also got some nice tricks up its sleeves for farming. All three specs are great and have their specific uses, so this class is nice and well-rounded. Brewmaster, at least as of this video, can take the talent Summon Blackhawk Statue to AoE taunt everything in a 20-yard radius. I don't use this as much as I used to, but it's great for mass open-world farming. Windwalker has epic speed, both passive and active use to live up to its name. Between Flying Serpent Kick, Rolls, and Chi Torpedoes, the 10% Windwalking Speed passive this one will get you where you need to go. My only grumble is that it doesn't have the spammable AoE that it used to, which is where Mistweaver comes in. Currently, Mistweaver can just spam their spinning crane kick to become an endless tornado of death, which is fantastic for just AoEing low-level trash mobs down. And Mist also has part of Windwalker's speed abilities in the form of Roll and Chi Torpedo, so that helps keep you fast. I like this spec for its speed and AoE, which is great for farming mass amounts of low-level content. Its lack of spammy AoE and super single weak ranged move, though, puts Monk at number 5 for me. Number 4. Demon Hunter. That's right, everyone's OP favorite class as of 8.3, so of course it's on my list. I happen to like Demon Hunter regardless of the crowd attention it gets, as it has amazing mobility in the form of its dashes, leaps, disengages, glide ability, and AoE. Havoc is the DPS spec that tends to get the most limelight due to its dash fell rush, its disengage called Vengeful Retreat, and the AoE talents it can take, as well as being able to take on more challenging content at lower item levels by just dishing out the damage. Vengeance, the tank spec, is actually my preference of the two for farming. They both have about the same speed, with Havoc being just a bit faster, but I rather like how Vengeance feels and it has a very similar toolkit to Havoc. I like being able to double leap with Infernal Strike and leave runes in my wake thanks to Flame Crash, so it just feels satisfying. I tend to be a tank player at heart though, so it could just be my bias showing through as Brewmaster and Vengeance happen to be my favorite tanks in the game. That said, Demon Hunter lacks the spamminess I'd like, as well as only having one decent ranged move, much like the Monk. So that's why this one's at number four for me. Number three, Druid. 
This one's probably the number one gold farm class for most people, mainly the Feral and Balance specs. Druid, in general, is super versatile in having all four roles of tank, heals, ranged DPS, and melee DPS in its arsenal, as well as a plethora of hugely useful utilities. Not only can you use all of your different forms and all of your specs, you can shapeshift into a flying mount instantly and interact with most objects without dismounting, including herbs. Since Tarn have the herbalism racial, that's why you'll often see herb farmers as Tarn druids. Feral also has a few speed and movement abilities like Dash, Stampeding Roar, Tiger Dash, and Wild Charge. Heck, this class even comes primed with a stealth ability called Prowl. It's usable in all specs, too. And on top of that, it's got decently spammable AoE thanks to Swipe, Brutal Slash, and Thrash, as well as a good ranged ability, Moonfire, for tagging things. All of which you can use while in Feral form with the right talents. There is a metric ton about this spec that's useful, including how all the different racials play well with the class, and it'd probably take an entire video to cover it. So let's just say that this is the best class for a possibly good time? <laughs> that's why Druid is at my number three. Number two, Rogue. Specifically, Subtlety. Now, that probably sounds a bit weird to you, as you don't hear rogues being all the rage for gold farming besides pickpocketing and stuff, right? Well, I got two words for you. Stealth speed and spammable AoE. Okay, that was more than two, but still, here's what I mean. At the time of 8.3, sub-rogues have the ability Shuriken Storm, which is a pretty strong AoE and is darn near spammable even with low haste. That's a plus for me, since that's something I like for farming. It also has at least one ranged ability, which actually does decent damage in old content, in the form of Shuriken Toss. And it's got unlimited stealth, which can come with talents that increase your speed while stealthed, such as Night Stalker, and passive healing while stealthed, such as Soothing Darkness. And if you're stealthed a lot for farming, that stuff is active almost constantly. Of course, you can also break combat with Vanish, which is a major boon if you run old content long enough to find glitches. Trust me on that. On top of all that, it's also got a speed boost in the form of Sprint, usable while stealthed. This is actually my preferred class for old raids like Blackrock Foundry, as I can easily skip all the trash that doesn't give loot, and I'm constantly almost as fast as a druid while doing it. Is druid faster? Probably. But I like sub more, so that's why this one's my number two. And at last, my number one favorite, you've probably guessed it if you know me by now, Hunter. Specifically Marksman, with a side of Beastmaster. I actually really like survival too, but not for gold farming. I'm a sucker for ranged abilities, and Hunter is the only class that can use its entire toolkit while moving. The ranged stuff, at least. Sorry, druids. In this case, Beastmaster is the one who's completely mobile, and can even take the talent Animal Companion, which lets them use two pets at once. If you make sure to have two pets out that give you the speed buff Pathfinding, you'll naturally have a passive 12% speed increase at all times. Both specs can also take the talent Trailblazer to increase your passive speed so long as you don't attack by 30%, which is great for making long runs and pulling whole instances in one shot. Coupled with the Beastmaster's Pathfinder pets, that's a constant 42% speed buff. Passive! Of course, this stacks with other speed buffs and your Aspect of the Cheetah dash ability too. Alternatively, you can take the talent Post Haste to give you a speed boost after each time you disengage, which is great if you spend a lot of time attacking and pulling in groups instead of entire long runs. Both specs also have CCs, slows, stuns, self heals, and even a shield, making them equipped, kind of like Druid, for many types of farming. And of course, their ranged abilities are just delicious, especially everyone's favorite, Barrage capable of pulling entire instances and pissing people off. Shh, it's okay, just let it happen. Multi-shot is the next best and virtually spammable, on top of being at least 40 yard range, so while Druid has Hunter beaten speed burst, Hunter's got range down pat. Why is Marksman on here though? Two reasons. One, I like how it plays more, even in its various versions over the years, and two, fast draw. The Marksman Legion Artifact, this gives you a passive 25% speed buff which stacks with all this other stuff. So long as you're in the Broken Isles. 
This buff was limited to the Broken Isles sometime in early BFA, which makes me uber sad, but it still lives on in my heart. So that's what matters. And all that puts my hunter at number one on my list. And there we have it. That's my little list of my favorite classes to do any type of gold farming with. This covers all the classes I use actually for all that stuff, typically. Hi y'all, Kraken Latte here. I've got a short list of tips for you about how you can generate a bit of easy gold. Now these aren't going to be radical get rich quick tips. These aren't going to be about spamming dungeons or what you should craft. Rather, these are simple things that take little effort and can keep you from being broke. So long as you don't have crazy spending habits. So let's get right into it. Tip number five, loot every mob. No exceptions. Not only do gray items add up, you can loot crafting materials, bind unequipped gear, pets, mounts, or other items that you can vendor or sell on the auction house. A lot of this won't be sent to your mailbox if you skip it either, so don't take that chance. Tip number four, loot every gathering node and skin every mob. If you have herbalism, mining, or fishing, then it's highly likely you'll pass quite a few of these gathering nodes during your travels. It only takes a few seconds to swoop down and pick that flower, and doing so anytime you see one will add up. Think about all that easy gold you're skipping. This goes for skinners too. If you have skinning, skin what you kill and try not to be lazy. Tip number three, disenchanting on alts. If you're playing even only one other character, then you're no stranger to the amount of bind on pickup gear you come across. If this gear isn't from the current expansion though, then it doesn't vendor for much. So rather than vendoring it for a few gold, why not disenchant it instead? You could at least sell the materials and get a bit more out of it. This goes for bind on equip gear too, but since you can sell those for transmog, make sure you check the price of the item before disenchanting or vendoring it. Tip number two, open lockboxes. While these aren't super common, it's likely you'll come across some every so often. Don't just vendor them. They can contain gold, materials, transmog, and some other things. Rogues can open them by default, but if you don't have one of those, blacksmiths, jewel crafters, and scribes can create items to open them as well, though those items are expansion specific. The rogue is the easiest option here. And tip number one, auction house everything daily. Now that you've been looting everything from Mog to Mats, you've got lots of stuff to sell. The auction house is much easier than it used to be, so even without the help of add-ons like Trade Skill Master, this is a simple task. I recommend doing this daily. Post all of your goods every day and things will eventually sell. Any item that can be used can be sold. This is a major factor in how I keep a stash of gold on me when I'm not actively raw gold farming. I do recommend getting TSM though, it does help speed things up. And there we have it! If you think I've missed information or you want to request I do a specific guide, let me know in the comments below. Even if I don't answer you, I just might add your idea to my list. As always, thank you so much for watching, and remember, it's never too latte.